Anybody over here need a ding ding? You guys can share. Yeah. So, hope everyone is doing well. Uh, this is the first Wednesday night, and we are back to our normally scheduled uh, Wednesday night time. Um, over the last few weeks, things have been kind of up in the air with camps and events and stuff like that. But from now on, Wednesdays at 6:30, be here. Invite your friends. Nice job, inviting your friends. Okay. Um, so tonight we are going to be starting a brand new series entitled "Build: How to Build a Faith That Will Last." Um, you can go to the next slide there, Judy. Um, my, uh, my remote is not working, so we're old school today. Old school. So, uh, some of you may remember that at the beginning of the summer, we had a series called... Before that... Yeah. <laughs> uh, we had a series called... Why? Why? Which Laura hated, and she's glad that it's over. Um, and I never said that. <laughs> I know. Yes. So we had a series called "Mine: Making Your Faith Your Own," and uh, this series is kind of um, moving on to the foundation of that series. Now, some of you are sitting here going, "Well, I wasn't there for that one." That's okay. Because this series can absolutely stand alone. And some of you are like, I was here, I don't remember anything. And that's okay. Okay, I taught the series, and I still have trouble remembering some of the things that I said. So, I don't blame you if you don't remember stuff. Uh, which is why sometimes it's important to uh, repeat ourselves. But this series is designed to kind of build on uh, to that one. Um, so it's going to be about building a faith that will last. Um, so it focuses on having a faith that not only that you own, it, and it's important to have a faith that, that is your own, but one that will last. Um, I, I was thinking about some of these questions you know, today as I was sitting in my office about you guys, because you know I, I love uh, the uh, privilege of discipleship and uh, to be walking alongside you all spiritually. And it made me start thinking about what do I hope to see in you guys five years from now, ten years from now? Um, what do I hope is built in you in terms of your faith that will actually last? Um, what do I hope to see uh, when you move away and for whatever reason? Uh, you know, sometimes families move and relocate, um, and, and I hope to see that, that your faith lasts even then. Um, or if I move away. You know, sometimes a pastor will leave a position and then uh, stuff happens in his absence, and I hope that that's not the case here. Uh, I, I hope that if me or Robert get hit by a bus, um, that things will continue, you know, that, that it's not built on us. I'm not hoping that we get hit by a bus, by the way, okay? If not, I'm trying to fix it. Um, if the church were to fall apart, which, you know, hopefully will never happen, but in the event that any of those things did occur, what would be left? And really, that, that's up to you uh, to answer. Um, because in the event that any of those things happen, or in the event of any change whatsoever, my hope, my prayer for you guys, is that you will have a faith that will stand the test of time. Um, continuing on. Um, I, I'm hoping that what you have is a faith that is built on Jesus. Um, and, and that's really the key. We're going to be focusing on what exactly it means to have a faith that is built on Jesus. Even if you own something, and, and this is going back to the line series, even if you own something and it's yours, if it's not built right, well then you're not really accomplishing much. It, it doesn't serve its purpose. And, and so not only is it important for us to own our faith, we have to own the right kind of faith. Rather than following in the footsteps of those who have gone before us that have made some mistakes, the hope is that we won't do that. That as we own it, we'll also have it built the right way. Um, so when things are not built properly, their, their purpose cannot be truly served. For example, 
what's wrong with this photo? It's only the part of it, it's not the entire Yeah, there's a lot of this gate missing, and yet it says, notice, keep gate closed and locked. <laughs> so what I would call a whole feel. Uh, this here is another example of a home or fail. You can see, uh, and if you can't, this right here is the wall. So this door is not going to open at all. you got to wonder what the guy is thinking who says, yeah, this is okay, right? Next we have uh, a door leading to nowhere. Right in this region, there is a door that wishes it were a window. That's right. That's trying so bad to be a window. Um, if somebody opens that door and walks through, uh, they will very quickly be in the bookshop that is right here. Um, it's one way to exit quickly. This is a very interesting setup. Well, if you can't see it, uh, there's a cut in the door that goes around the toilet so that the door can actually open. Because prior to this being cut into the door, the door would just probably hit the toilet. So they decided, aha, brilliant idea, and they cut a hole in the door. Now, what they probably want thinking is that when you close this door, there's a hole <laughs> right here. And so anybody walking by will be like, what's going on in there? Occupied. Yeah. This, uh, this did not uh, obviously have very much foresight. Um, this is one of those weird European bathrooms, I hope. Uh, because if I were ever in this situation, I don't know what I would do. This will create some awkward conversation. <laughs> yes, this is the conference call of urinals here. Um, so when something, when something is not built properly, doesn't serve its purpose. When something is not built in the way that it's supposed to be, it's not going to accomplish anything worth. And our faith is very similar. We have to have faith that is built right and, and on the right foundation. And so um, that faith is built on Jesus. Uh, as you can see there on the board, on the screen rather, um, what the builders in those pictures did was they took shortcuts. Rather than doing the hard work of doing it right, rather than taking the time to uh, make sure that it was built up to code, rather than looking at the blueprints, they just cut before they measured and made it work, and jerry-rigged it. Um, they took shortcuts. And, uh, and because they did, we got some very goofy-looking homes. Now, here's the thing. Oftentimes in the church, we do the very same thing. We take shortcuts in our faith. Rather than doing the hard work of doing it right, we take some shortcuts, including uh, some, of, some of these. Um, it is much easier to rely on your pastor or your youth pastor to do the hard work of Bible study than to do it yourself. And unfortunately, one of the shortcuts that a lot of people take in the church is expecting that they are only going to be fed the Word of God when a pastor is preaching. Rather than doing the hard work of actually spending time in the Word every day themselves, studying for themselves, asking the pastor what kind of resources are beneficial, um, because the pastor, I, if you ask me that question, you say, hey, uh, what, can, what can you give me to help me do Bible study every day? Or I'm going to put stuff in my hands. But unfortunately, what people do is they say, I'll hear it on Sunday. I'll hear it on Wednesday. That'll be, you know, where I get my fix. But think about it like this. If you were to say, you know what? Rather than cook,
cooking, I'm eating myself. I'll just go to a restaurant every Wednesday night and every Sunday morning. And uh, that'll be the two times that I eat every week. Um, and I'll be good. We can do that. That'd be crazy. It'd be crazy to think that you can only eat two times a week. But that's exactly what we do with our, with our faith, that we take the shortcut of relying on the pastor. Um, and it's not just in Bible study. Many times people take the shortcut of relying on their pastor for all of their spiritual development. And, and unfortunately, sometimes people build the foundation on the pastor rather than building it on Jesus. And so if that pastor is ever gone, then their faith falls apart because it was built on the wrong thing. That's a shortcut. Another uh, shortcut that we take is that it's much easier to rely on a worship leader to move into the presence of God. But oftentimes when we think of worship and praise, we think that has to wait until Sunday morning or Wednesday night, and that's really not the case at all. Um, just uh, probably in the last couple of years, um, this thing was invented called an iPod. It's weird. It's a crazy contraption that will fit in your pocket, and it has like hundreds of songs on it. Yes. It's the greatest thing I've ever seen. Like a Walkman. I did drive into the future in a DeLorean with my Walkman, and most of you have no idea what that even is. <laughs> a Walkman. I used to have a CD player that I would hook to my belt, and it would, it would skip. <laughs> you know, I couldn't jog because it would skip. And so if I was running and I had my CD player, I would have to hold it in my hand like this and run <laughs> so that it wouldn't skip. Uh -huh. It's a different type of times. Um, but we have this, this idea that worship can only happen when we're here at church. We have this idea that worship can only happen if we're at camp. You know, those of you that have been to, to a youth camp, um, some of you have been to a couple of uh, those with us, um, we have this idea that man, nothing can ever compare to worshiping God there. Well, that's really not true. Because the same God that's there is here as well. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We can worship Him at any time. And so it's foolish for us to believe that we have to put that off until we're at camp. Um, among other shortcuts that we take, the youth group or, or your church. You know, we take the shortcut of believing that our faith rests and falls on our peers, or our friends. Um, you know, we, we put so much emphasis on the, the Wednesday night experience or the Sunday night experience that throughout the week it's as if we're empty waiting for that to fix. And again, not that there's anything wrong with youth group. I love youth group. If I did not, I would not be in this position because it would be really crazy. Um, but we can't build the foundation on the youth group or even in the church as a whole. We can't build the foundation on our friends because if we do, then what we will find is that our faith is built on the wrong foundation. And when that foundation moves, when, when any of those things are not there, all of a sudden we crumble. That is not a faith that's built on the proper foundation of Jesus. So, we're going to be talking about in this series uh, a, a faith that is built on Christ. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, this is going to be the, um, the passage that we are studying over the next four weeks. Um, is uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 12, and we'll focus on some of the different uh, verses here every week. But here, at least at the beginning of the series, I'm going to read um, this to you. Uh, if you're looking for Second Peter, uh, I'm sorry, for First Peter, you can find the book of James and continue on to the right. Uh, if you find Second Peter, you've gone too far. So, we're in the book of First Peter. Chapter 2, starting in verse 4. It says this, As 
you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the building is rejected has become the capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. We have such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. So the, the verses that we're going to be focusing on for this lesson are verses 4 through 8. And these verses talk about the cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. And the first thing that it tells us in, in verse 5 is that you are being built into a spiritual house. That God has a purpose for each one of you, that you are all supposed to be a piece uh, of the body that He is building. Right? Each one of us has a purpose, and, and it calls each one of us a stone. Thanks. I'm a rock. You might say, I rock. <laughs> Man, I am funny. Yeah. We are all stones in this spiritual house that God is building. But the key to this passage is that every single one of these stones is built on a cornerstone. Um, the way that, um, that construction worked in the first century is that any structure that was built was begun by laying the foundation of one big, even stone. And it, was a, it had to be perfectly even, and they spent a lot of time on that stone specifically because it was what everything else would be built off of. And they would lay it in one corner, and everything else had to square up to that. Um, the, uh, the cornerstone is not so important in the way that buildings are built now um, because of um, the advances of science and all that and the technology. Um, but back then, it was very, very important for there to be a perfectly even and, and well-proportioned cornerstone. And every single stone was built on that. That, that was where every stone found its foundation. And so this passage tells us that for us, that cornerstone that every single one of us is supposed to be built on is Jesus. Our cornerstone is not the church. Although the church is very important, it is not the cornerstone. Our cornerstone is not our leaders. Although our leaders are very important, we are not the cornerstone. Our, our cornerstone is not our friends, our parents, our um, Efforts, all of those things are important and they have value, but none of those things are the cornerstone. The cornerstone has to be Jesus. If we're not built on that, then ultimately we will crumble. A house that was built in the first century that didn't properly line up with the cornerstone, eventually would structurally collapse. Because that everything depended on being built on the cornerstone. So the first thing that we learn here is that God has the purpose of us being built on Jesus. Number two, uh, every stone <coughs> has to conform to the cornerstone. And again, because that's the, uh, the center, and everything must square up to that in order for the structure to stand, what that means for us is that every single day as we journey in our relationship, 
relationship with Christ, we have to be continually conformed to His image. And our tendency is to be conformed to the image of the world, to follow the crowd in whatever they're doing, but not just being conformed to the world. Sometimes we're conformed to the, the church crowd, right? And, and that feels like it should be better. And hopefully it's, it's not immoral, but just because it's not immoral doesn't mean that it's Jesus. And so we can't conform ourselves even to our our peers, unless our peers are being conformed to Christ. Our, our goal every single day is to be conformed to Him. To be looking to Him every day and asking uh, the cliche, almost question, what would Jesus do? You know, that's, that's what we have to conform ourselves to every day. Um, rather than following after our own whims, or doing whatever we feel like doing, our task each day is to say, how can I conform myself to Jesus Christ? Um, next, we see here in verse 8, um, it says, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. It says they stumble because they disobey the message. Those who do not conform to Jesus Christ will stumble. They will stumble because they have, they have missed the goal, which is to be built on the cornerstone. And, and I, I'm telling you guys, I hate watching this happen to students in youth groups, because it happens all the time. You know, I've shared this statistic with you a thousand times, that according to some studies, approximately 90% of kids who are involved in youth group graduate high school and leave the church. That is ridiculous. In, in a room like this, that would mean one or two of you would still be following after Christ after high school. <laughs> it's like, us two. What are those means? I love it. <laughs> it's like, it's going to be us. And hopefully that's the attitude. That's, that's the proper attitude to have. I want it to be me. If you look at me and you, there's not going to be many following Jesus. It's going to be me. And I can't look to anybody else to make that decision for me. I can't just go with the crowd, because here's the thing. If we rely on the youth group, or the youth pastor, I can make you a promise. Well, it's more than likely going to happen. I can't make this promise. But more than likely, you're going to graduate high school. Most of you will do that, okay? Hopefully, yes. You will hopefully graduate high school. If you do not graduate high school, at some point you are going to become too old to be in youth group. Unless you're in leadership. Um, we have those who are still young enough to be here. Yes. Still young enough, okay? But when the role changes, Okay, and so here's the thing. Inevitably, there comes a day when if you're leaning on youth group to keep you straight with Jesus, youth group is not going to be there someday. And what do you have left? If you've been relying on a pastor, again, what happens if that pastor goes somewhere else? What happens if you go somewhere else? You know, you move and go to college or you know, you get a job somewhere else, whatever, and all of a sudden that person that you've been leaning on is no longer there. What then? The those who stumble do so because they failed to build on Jesus on a daily basis. And so I'm telling you guys, if we don't have a faith that's built on that, it is not going to last. Sure, it'll be okay for a while. You'll get by for a, co a couple of years, you know, you you float along, but then graduation hits, and all of a sudden people start dropping like flies. I do not want to see that happen. I want to see you building your faith on Jesus Christ. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
lots of stuff becomes much more interesting. Um, here's the thing about church. Uh, church can be fun, but church is never going to be able to out-entertain the world. The world is always going to be able to do a much better job because it's much better resourced and that's its focus. The world is always going to be shinier on the surface. It's always going to do a better job of having better stuff. So if it's about the stuff, then it's only a matter of time before you fall. It has to be built on Jesus and realizing that nothing is better than Jesus. So, we must ask the following question. What does it look like to build on Jesus? Practically speaking. Every day, you must do the hard work of commitment. Not something that only you can do. Okay, I cannot do this for you. Your parents or your grandparents cannot do this for you. Your senior pastor cannot do this for you. As much as we would love to, <laughs> you know, there are times when we would really love to just go into somebody's life and say, all right, time to make your decisions for you. <laughs> I would love to hear that sometimes, but we can't. You are the only one that can make that choice every single day. And so every single day, you have to be the one to decide, am I going to spend time in the Word? Am I going to spend time in prayer? Am I going to do the hard work of devoting myself to studying Scripture? Here's a little tidbit for you guys. Sometimes, sometimes the Bible is boring. It's a very unspiritual thing for a pastor to say. And I fear that this is somehow going to end up on the internet. So I said, sometimes the Bible is boring. Oh, she's tweeting it right now. Thank you. It's on the internet. Um, here's the deal. Sometimes we read passages. <laughs> sometimes we read passages, uh, passages of Scripture and we look at it and go, All right. Thanks, God. I don't know what any of that meant. But the important thing is that we spend time with you anyway. Um, I literally think sometimes when I'm reading the Bible, especially in the Old Testament often, I'll read a passage and I'll say... <laughs> yeah. uh, sometimes I'm reading a passage in the Old Testament and I'll literally say to myself, God, you're being weird again. Because there's some strange stuff in there, you know? God, you're being weird again. But am I willing to do the hard work of a relationship? A relationship is hard work sometimes. We enjoy a relationship, but sometimes a relationship requires some, you know, dedication. Um, and the same is true with the Lord. That every single day, am I willing to be committed enough to focus? And we need to be committed enough to say, I'm going to show anything else out and, and be in this. That, that's only a, a commitment that you can make every single day. Um, rather than waiting for somebody else to force you to do it, which is what so many people do. Um, let me just say about this, you know, rather than waiting for somebody else to force you to do it, um, one of the things that I see in Christian dating relationships, when two Christians are dating, um, I'll inevitably hear one of them say, man, I love our relationship. This person you know, urges me to read my Bible every day. I, I appreciate that about them. It, it reminds me that I have to do it. And they think to themselves, man, this is great. It's a great relationship. And I'm sitting over there going, you need a girlfriend to remind you to read your Bible every day? <laughs> you should be doing that without someone. You, know, you need a boyfriend to, to be your spiritual director? You got a problem. You know? And, and not just in dating relationships, but if you have to wait on me to force you to read your Bible, then, then that's, that's on you. You know? You pursue a loving relationship with God every day. Um, this is something that we can enjoy and love and pour 
ourselves into, but the only person that can make that choice is you. It can't be me. It can't be your parents. It can't be Robert. It can't be your friends. You are the only one who can decide, I'm going to be committed to building on Jesus and Jesus alone. Because that's the one thing that will never go away. Here's the one thing that's never going to change. The cornerstone is perfectly square and will always be there. So unless you build on that, you ultimately will crumble. As we go throughout this series, we're going to be talking about what exactly it means practically to follow after Jesus and build a faith on Him and Him alone. So I'm excited about exploring this uh, with you guys. Um, I'm going to pray, and then I have one announcement to make, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to build on Jesus. And Lord, I pray that that's a decision each one of these students would make. Lord, that we would not build ourselves on a leader or a group or our peers, but rather on Christ alone. And Father, I pray that each one of these students will make decisions of faith that will last because they're built on the right foundation. That 10 years, 20 years, 50 years from now, each one of them will still be following after you and impacting others to do the same. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So